Hi, it's Haley. We're back for another episode of Therapy Talks. Today we have Lisa Ann Butcher and she joins us to talk about her previous personal experiences as a healthcare worker and how she took all of that wonderful information, brought it into her clinical practice to become a therapist. And today we talk about what it's like for an experience of a healthcare worker throughout the pandemic, day-to-day experiences, the trauma they have, and how to best support these individuals moving forward. I'm Haley. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Yeah. I'm, I'm really happy for you to join us on the podcast today. And um, I was just reading up like on your little bio and things. And I was hopeful that we could talk about like your practice within first responders. Would that be a comfortable topic for you? Mm-hmm, for sure. Okay. Wonderful. So um, would it be okay for you to just maybe introduce yourself and like your professional background? And let's start with that. Sure. My name is Lisa Butcher, and I'm a registered clinical counselor with the BC Association of Clinical Counselors. I started my practice uh, several years ago after having a long career as a respiratory therapist. So I worked as a registered respiratory therapist in both Ontario and BC um, for almost two decades. And probably I would say 10 years before I completed my time as an RT. I mean, you're always an RT, you kind of always identify as one as people do with nurses and doctors, whether you're working as a nurse or a doctor, you always feel like a nurse or a doctor. Um, But uh, I kind of found myself more interested in the psychological effects of illness. Um, So I was treating my patients for physical illness and noticing the effects of the mental part of their disease on not only them, but also their family as well. Um, And so I decided to go back to school and get my um, master's in counseling psychology. And here I am. And I I basically have started a practice uh, that's rapidly grown. Actually, I have to say the pandemic, unlike for most people, was very Um, let's say lucrative in the way that a lot of people were struggling mentally during the pandemic, obviously, as we all were, um, and still are to a certain extent. And I I decided to open a practice specially tailored to first responders. So police, fire, ambulance, nursing, uh, physicians, respiratory therapists, uh, personal support workers. And it's been really, really helpful, I think, just to watch that grow over the last few years. Mm -hmm. That sounds so wonderful. So for you, you were always interested in the relation of the body and the mind. And so you started mostly with the body and then transitioning to the mind and the impact that um, illness had on not only the individual, but families, friends, all the social circles. And then throughout the pandemic transitioned into recognizing that need for first responders and their well-being. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such a niche thing that that a lot of people don't understand unless you're in healthcare. And I think what I've provided to clients is that background of working on the front line forever, because I worked in acute care for almost uh, 20 years. Uh, I do have that understanding. That's that baseline understanding where someone doesn't have to explain what it is that happened at work. I already know their job. I understand what happened at a say code blue when someone wasn't breathing or didn't have a heart rate and they can kind of explain how they felt versus what they were doing and what it means. Um, What people have always said to me is when they go through their, uh, their workplace for sort of like what's called EAP counselors, where they'll, they'll assign you to a counselor uh, that's sort of trained or has taken a course in working with first responders. They're not actual first responders, so they they don't understand the the lingo and the dialogue that's coming out of it. So it's it's almost like a two pronged approach where you have to explain what happened first prior to getting into how you actually felt. So Mm -hmm. it sounds like you have a great capability then of developing that rapport because of your Mm -hmm. own personal experiences and just understanding some of the different things that would happen working in the hospitals or in healthcare specifically. Exactly. Maybe you could also just highlight, like, what would you wish maybe some other clinicians would understand about that first responder healthcare um, practice or like the employees and staff working there? Like, what would be something you wish other clinicians would kind of be able to understand a little bit more? That's an interesting question. I've not thought of that before. I think one of the things that jumps to mind right off the bat is that there's a culture to people who work in healthcare. Mm -hmm. Um, And by culture, I don't mean mean ethnicity, obviously. I mean culture. It's a workplace culture. It's a personality culture. Uh, Different for nurses, different for RTs, different for physicians, and physicians in different areas. Emerge docs are different than ICU docs, which are different than palliative care docs. 
Um, but I think the biggest thing that I think is, is really relevant that I see is, is um, not assuming that um, healthcare workers are like everyone else in terms of what they're thinking and feeling. You have to understand that healthcare workers are exposed on a daily basis to things that other people don't see it becomes almost secondary or natural to them to witness traumatic events. Um, And it's difficult for them to process, but they also, the, the part of their culture is to almost see it and then move on to something else. And that's something I find I have to break into really hard with people when they come into my office. Every single healthcare worker will come into my office literally without fail and apologize for being there because they feel like they shouldn't need to be there. Other people have harder things happening. And it's the first thing we talk about is that they have uh, you know, a reason to be there and they're just as valid and what they're going through um, is something that they don't have to be ashamed of and they don't have to uh, shoulder as if it doesn't bother them. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you're really just expressing like this idea of stoicism that an individual who's working in healthcare has to just be okay with what they're seeing, even though it may be normal for them to see these traumatic experiences on a regular basis. That isn't the norm across all of society. Mm -hmm. It's interesting you said that about stoicism. That's exactly it. There's sort of this underlying culture of stoicism where, and it's not to say that hospitals don't debrief. They do. They offer debriefings. Every traumatic event I've ever seen or every tra- uh, trauma that's come into emerge, I've always been offered a debriefing, but people rarely go to them. And interestingly, I've talked to a lot of healthcare workers that talk about kind of this idea of secondary trauma where, you know, and I've posted about this on social media, actually, is that is that what is the trauma? Is it us actually seeing the traumatic event? Is it seeing somebody come in and their body is mangled or something has happened? Or is it going to these debriefings or talking to family where you start to hear intimate details about that person? You start to hear their nickname or you hear their mom talk about them or, oh, we were supposed to go to Disneyland for our next trip. And those are the things that become traumatic. It's these details rather than the actual event for a lot of people. So I think that's an important thing for people working with people in healthcare is is to know that there's so many layers to that trauma. Mm -hmm. So it's like that rippling effect. So like, even though the stone hit the lake to start it at all, it's like the rippling outwards of like how it therefore affects their life on multiple different ways. Exactly. Yeah. And this translates into everything. I mean, I know even as a mom, I'm a single mom and uh, worked in healthcare for years and it actually changed how I parented things that I've seen as a healthcare worker changed how I viewed the world, changed how I parented. I remember being very afraid of things that probably wouldn't have been necessarily fears of mine prior to being in healthcare, things like I don't know, children eating grapes. And I used to actually cut my kids grapes, which seems crazy if you're not in healthcare, but just as a respiratory therapist, to me, it was like the exact diameter of a child's airway. (laughs) So I would cut it and, and it would actually make me feel quite worried um, them eating certain things or running while they've got a sucker in their mouth or things like that, that um, I think changes the way people even view the world or parents. So I think that's really relevant as well. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like, as we even are born, we're so we're almost naive and we have this wonderful innocence about us. And as we grow up, right. And even into adulthood, but then when we step into these healthcare professional roles, the, the caring profession, first responders, that um, image of the world, like you're saying is just shattered even more, or we're starting to see things more seriously. And like, like, mm-hmm. yeah, like you said, your example of cutting grapes, it's like, well, it's a grape. And like, logically I could agree with you. Cause they're, I feel like I've almost choked on a grape before as an yeah. adult, but, um, <laughs> but like you see things yeah. differently, you're more cautious. So it's almost like this hypervigilance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's very true. I mean, I mean, and I know that I do uh, bond with healthcare workers that way when, when in my practice is we, we almost, you have to make a bit of a joke about it, about the um, let's say hypervigilance about those things where, you know, I remember a nurse telling me years ago when, you know, her, her child was playing at the top of the stairs and, and she was in a group of moms and there was the, her child was playing with another mom's child. And the other mom said, Oh, honey, be careful. You're going to fall backwards down the stairs and break your arm. And the nurse said to me, my immediate, thought was you're going to fall backwards down the stairs and break your neck, you know, and it was this totally different thing of, you know, what's normal to break your arm, Mm -hmm. what's abnormal to break your neck, but that's where someone goes. Right. And it's, I think that rippling effect of the trauma, it's years and years and years of, of seeing things that other people don't see. They seem more commonplace. I remember when I was having, I have three kids and I remember when I was having my kids, I used to feel like it was very, 
let's say potentially dangerous to have kids. Cause I, as an RT only get called to deliveries when things go wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. And then it's such a natural thing, right. Having a baby and, and things don't go wrong normally. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it really changes that. And I think that there's something to be aware of in terms of um, let's say the general population talking to people who are working in healthcare on a day-to-day -day basis. And that was prior to the pandemic, Never mind now. Mm -hmm. Cause like when things go wrong, that's such a small percentage of the time, yeah. but if that's all that you see as a healthcare professional, then obviously your whole lens is shifted. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, and maybe even taking more like for like, I'll tease myself on like, whenever I go on like a boat, even if we're just floating and not even doing anything, I'm like, I'm wearing my life jacket because I'm more <laughs> cautious. Cause I know like, because of everything that we hear, I'm just going to play it a little bit more safely just because unfortunately of the, um, un the ungood, like the not good things that are, I hear about. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, Oh, he's just going to take a little bit slower, or easier, or do things a little bit more gentler. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's something that healthcare workers don't often think about that I always encourage them to seek counseling for is you don't think that it has impacted you in that way, but you also don't want to shift your perspective to feel like the world is an unsafe place and to feel like um, the outcome is always going to be negative. And that's not actually the case. It's actually far from true. So I think it's really important as well to constantly balance that of like, what are you seeing at work versus what is the actual commonality or likelihood of what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. And not to become pessimistic, right? Yeah. If everything you're seeing is awful, then it's like, it would be really easy to transfer that um, lens to day to day in a pessimistic way, right? And that would be exactly. where we get the burnout, right? The compassion fatigue, things like that. So it's more important exactly. to go as a, like, I always joke to people, I'm like, oh, like, they're like, oh, I'm so happy to see you today. I'm like, me too. And I'm, they're like, thanks for being here for me. I'm like, oh, well, I'm actually here for myself. Because if I'm not well, <laughs> like with obviously jokingly with a client, because I'm like, if I'm not well, then I can't help you today. So this is actually a bit of a, a dance between the both of us. Yeah. And actually, it's funny you say that because I've actually almost felt the opposite at times where people will say to me in my counseling practice, oh, I'm so sorry to tell you all this. You must have it so together. You're a counselor. And I, you know, and I've always laughed, like, you should see me this morning trying to get my three kids out the door. So-and-so forgot their shoes. So-and-so forgot their backpack. And here I am sitting calmly in my office as if you know, I'm exempt from all of those things, but it's like regular day to day stuff. Everybody goes through the same things. And I think that's kind of the normalization of all of our experiences together. Mm -hmm, definitely. So I think it's really great for that question to summarize. It's like you would wish for other clinicians to understand like the layering effect of what it means to be a healthcare professional and not only just the one incident. So that's where you say like maybe some of the failings are from like the, you said the EAP programs um, is that they're trying to really maybe just identify the one incident that was traumatic for them, not necessarily all of the other things that came as a result from all of that. Yeah. And I mean, I think it affects relationships. It affects how you parent. It affects everything. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's maybe not uh, commonly thought of mm -hmm. when we talk about counseling for healthcare professionals. So what are you seeing with your first responder clients currently? Like, obviously we're changing from a pandemic to more of the endemic, or is there some trends and themes that you see overall? Um, I'm seeing a lot of residual stress, um, people breaking down, crying in my office. Uh, I'll, there's this sort of, um, commonly held belief by people who are not in healthcare that, um, see the pandemic didn't really mean anything because here we are on the other side of it and there was nothing to worry about, or had we just allowed everyone to get sick quicker, this is the outcome that would have happened a year ago. Uh, and what people don't understand, and I think it's very frustrating to healthcare workers, is that the reason we are where we are is because so many people got vaccinated. And as soon as you vaccinate, you decrease the viral load that is going around. And I'm not a doctor, but I, I you know, as an RT, I can safely say um, the viral load is what makes you get sick. You know, if you have a lower viral load, like if I sort of cough or sneeze near you, but not really in your vicinity, you're going to get less sick than if I sneezed right in your face yes. um, because you get a higher viral load when it hits you head on. Right. So mm -hmm. the more people get vaccinated, the lower the viral load is. And I think that's the frustration a lot of healthcare workers see um, is that there's sort of this, uh, who cares? And, you know, to be honest, what, what do we need when we go through something traumatic? We need someone to validate, wow, I'm sorry that experience was so hard. That sounds like it was really hard to deal with. What can I do to best support you? And they're not getting that. They're still having the bed shortages. They're still having the canceled surgeries. They're still having a lot of staff shortages. Um, 
but it's sort of like, Kate, let's move on. We're past the pandemic. Let's go. And it's this sort of lack of acknowledgement of what they've been through, I think is really impactful to them. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's possibly because individuals who are not in healthcare maybe aren't noticing the repercussions on a regular basis? And also just like everything was so much that they couldn't maybe hold space for it in their own experience. And so they're like, okay, let's dust it off and move forward. Yes, for sure. And I have to say in my practice, because I don't only see healthcare workers, I mostly see them, but obviously I, there's other people I see that are not like they might be family members of healthcare workers or, or just general practice um, that I see people in my general practice. Um, there are a lot of people who, who just really couldn't wrap their head around what was happening. And, and that is something to be acknowledged. It was difficult. It, not everybody has the same capabilities mentally. Not everybody is, is starting from the same baseline. Uh, there's people with underlying depression, underlying anxiety, and it really was just too hard to contemplate even my own friends. And I mean, we, you know, I've done a lot of talks on this in the past two years about the friendships that have been lost through COVID. Um, and even with my own friends, my best friend actually was quite anti COVID. Um, and, and most of my friends are also in healthcare. So she was not in healthcare. And then my other friends are in healthcare. And and there was very different rhetoric coming out from either side mm -hmm. uh, that was very difficult to navigate. And I know people have distanced themselves from family, whether it's because they're sort of really cautious with COVID or they don't believe in it at all. And it was very polarized. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's something that that is also very, very relevant when we talk mm -hmm. about what's happened. For sure, the divide, right, in mm -hmm. terms of the discussions and the sides and lack of, like you said, the holding space or validation of someone's experience. I think yeah. a lot of people think that validation means that it's agreeing with someone, but it's not. Validating is just going and offering compassion for your experience or offering kindness or holding space for it, but does not mean someone has to agree with that experience. Yeah, and and conversely, I have to say on, on the, you know, if we think about uh, holding space for non-healthcare workers, I have to say, you know, there is something to be said for validating, you know, I'm sorry, that was so hard. I understand that would be very, very stressful. I had people in my office who were literally terrified of COVID or getting vaccinated or, I mean, any number of things, but they, the information they had was very different. You know, I actually spoke to someone one time and said she was going to Mexico and she said, thankfully, when she got um, the COVID test before going, she didn't get the one that went into her brain is what she said. Mm -hmm. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, there's one that goes right into your brain. And then one that just goes into your nose. And if you truly believed that a COVID test was going to enter your brain, mm -hmm. that would be terrifying. Mm -hmm. And she truly believed it. So I, you know, I mean, I think it's really important to acknowledge that that people are just doing their best with the information they have. And, you know, there was a lot of different information coming out and I think it impacted everybody in a different way. Um, and I often talk to healthcare workers about trying to see it from other people's perspective as well. If you, if you truly didn't have the knowledge that someone has as a healthcare worker, how terrifying would it be to be in a pandemic, a global pandemic? Mm -hmm, definitely. I always will never forget. Um, it's interesting how our minds do this, but I remember seeing on like the internet, like a video of a man in a full hazmat suit in China and he was like a taxi driver. And it was like, I think it was like February of 2020. And I was like, whoa, like what's going on there? And I will never forget that in that moment feeling and looking back now being like, how naive was I like thinking that was going to be coming here. And just like some of the images that were coming out. And so that was like, so strange, but it just kind of, like you said, like that's how kind of mind works. It picks and holds and sticks to things that we think are really true. And I do, I jokingly say, sometimes it feels like the COVID test is going into your brain, but <laughs> definitely. Yeah. And I actually, as an RT, it's funny. I mean, the number of times I've suctioned someone up their nose, I thought I can't even make a sound with this because if I do, it's so hypocritical because I've put things on people's nose for the last 20 years. So I've been yeah. my mouth shut. I know my eyes are watering. I'm fine. It's fine. I can't help it. Totally fine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so I am curious though. So more on the modalities and the treatment that you offer to first responders. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the person, right? I find a lot of people will come with a specific treatment in mind. Um, and they say, Oh, I really want to try CBT cognitive behavioral therapy, or I really want to try EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization reprocessing. Um, that's kind of like the typical trauma treatment. Um, but 
interestingly, a lot of people think they have trauma and don't necessarily have trauma. So I've had people say, I need EMDR because I have trauma. But then when they recount something and, you know, oftentimes when people have recounted something several times, they won't have a, a visceral or physical reaction to it, or they don't seem particularly distressed by it. But if they are recounting it for the first or maybe second time, often they'll have a reaction to it. Um, I, I have seen paramedics specifically. I think that's a very overlooked part of healthcare. Uh, paramedics specifically are in the absolute trenches of what's going on and what has been going on. And, and they really they don't have the resources around them. Like when someone comes into the hospital with something going on, we have endless backup, right? We have every equipment, piece of equipment known to man. We have so much you know, power in terms of people there. Um, any expert you can call is right at a touch of a button. Paramedics are in the field. They're literally, you know, on their knees between someone's toilet and someone's shower trying to get them up. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think when I see paramedics and they talk to me about their experiences, they really are often traumatized and they will shake and they'll cry and they'll tell me things that are very, very distressing. In that way, I'll often use EMDR. So, it, you know, it's usually talking about the experience. It's identifying uh, what it is, uh, sort of going through the experience, talking about um different aspects of it and then trying to shift perspective a little bit so taking those sort of let's say negative core beliefs about a particular experience or and really it's actually about what you feel about yourself that you've sort of got from that experience and then shifting that to a more adapted positive um core core belief about yourself mm -hmm. um Oftentimes you see people who've endured a lot of trauma, they actually truly believe something about themselves. Like I am a failure. I don't deserve to exist. Um, things that seem like they would be hard to contemplate for someone who's not going or has not experienced trauma are very common. And they're just very set in their values about themselves that this is what I deserve. I don't deserve anything more than this. I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. um, so EMDR is one as well. I also like dialectical behavioral therapy is something very interesting to me as well. There's something called the DBT workbook that people often come to me with that I think is just phenomenal. Um, Dr. Mar Marshall Linehan was the person who founded DBT. Um, and originally it was used to treat borderline personality disorder. Um, but it, it's very effective for so many things. It sort of gives you that ability to hold totally opposing views and values in your mind at the same time. Um, you can be okay with something uh, and then also not okay with it in the same um, sort of frame. Um, it allows us to kind of be to radically accept things that we maybe wouldn't have accepted before, but still hope that they can change. So it kind of gives you that more I don't know, let's say balanced approach where we're not going from zero to a hundred or we're not being so polarized or all or nothing in our views. So I really like DBT as well amongst, you know, lots of other things. I have many practitioners that work in my practice uh, that practice everything from narrative therapy to um, art and play therapy and art and play therapy actually interestingly is quite um, helpful as well for first responders who, who can be creative in, in getting their thoughts out, uh, using art or, or play therapy as well. Well, that's so wonderful. So EMDR, DBT, play therapy, art therapy, a lot of wonderful different modalities. Mm -hmm. Um, I was curious though, like earlier you were saying, um, when a client is recounting their experience and you're, they're saying, I need, I would like to do EMDR, I have trauma. And then you're saying, well, wait, like what's happening here? So maybe could you express or explain a little bit more about what you meant by that point? Yeah. So some people will say to me, for example, I need EMDR because I've had lots of trauma. And then when we sort of go into what their trauma is, uh, oh, my boyfriend cheated on me, you know, or um, I had diabetes when I was a kid. And so, and, you know, maybe they still do, obviously, because it would be probably type one diabetes, but something like that. So, okay. So, and it's not to say that's not traumatic for sure, mm -hmm. but when you actually look at it, it's an adverse event. Um, but it hasn't necessarily caused a lot of people will say I have post-traumatic stress, you know, and I'm not a physician, I'm not a psychologist, so I can't diagnose that. Um, but people are just convinced they have PTSD. So because they have PTSD, therefore I need EMDR and I need to process my trauma. Um, but they assign the word trauma to things that are not necessarily traumatic or have not been traumatic to them. So they're adverse events. So we like to kind of look at the actual history of the person and, and take a full intake, obviously, and see. Um, but oftentimes I'll recommend something totally different. Like I, I often use something called narrative therapy, which is that idea where 
it just basically helps people build bridges over things that they feel they shouldn't have experienced. Like I often describe it and I've done this before in podcasts, for example, where I'll say, you know, it's like we're walking through a forest for a hundred years and that's our journey in life. And every single river that we come to in the forest represents an issue or an adverse event. Some are teeny tiny creeks that we can just hop over and we don't need to build a bridge over. And then other things are more major and they are huge crevasses or huge rivers that we need to actually build a bridge over. Um, but some people will get stuck at the edge of that river and they just refuse to cross it because they shouldn't be there. Like my, my husband shouldn't have cheated on me. I shouldn't have got, you know, uh, MS or, you know, all these different things that happen and they just refuse to kind of move past it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so all of these therapies, particularly narrative therapy, but narrative therapy allows you to kind of rewrite your story or change the course of your story. Um, not trying to get rid of parts of it, but, but integrating them into your journey as you continue forward. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to highlight the difference between like trauma and like adverse life events. So would your definition be that an adverse life event, life event is something that one could not be affected currently? Um, I would say an adverse life event is something that was unexpected or something that was maybe unplanned, Mm -hmm. um, something that was stressful for the person, but not necessarily causing post-traumatic stress. Right. Yeah. Okay. I'm just, cause I'm curious as well. Cause I also use EMDR my practice. And so I'm trying to conceptualize like the lens that you're using. And so maybe for me, um, I think I would then look at it, go, is that adverse a light life event still causing challenges in the present exactly. or is it still causing a trigger going forth? Yes, exactly. So that's a, that's a perfect example is sometimes people will say, okay, I had this traumatic event, but then they, they sort of use that as a way that that is the reason that I, this, 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 that may be true, but we also want to look at, you know, there's one thing about identifying why we do certain things, but it's also another to be more solution focused where we think, okay, here we are. How do we get past this. Um, And I think oftentimes this one traumatic event that they say is a traumatic event that traumatized them um, isn't necessarily all of it, right? It can be just their um, lack of coping skills or lack of supports. And I think it's really important to take a, a, a holistic view of that. Um, Mm -hmm. and certainly EMDR, I have to say EMDR works with a lot of things, right? I, Mm -hmm. I, it's not just, used for trauma. I remember when I actually took my EMDR course, it was not actually used for trauma. I mean, it was, but you can use it with a million different things. So, and like for, yeah, I think that's like a great idea because I think what you're trying to say is that some individuals say that the certain experiences have stopped them from living their life to the fullest or moving forward. Mm -hmm. Right. But then if we could apply EMDR to help them to move forward, like even if we do some resourcing with, um, Uh, bilateral stimulation, something like that, we could allow them to move forward. It doesn't necessarily have to be the full eight phase protocol, but we can use portions of EMDR to help them to move forward. And I'm a bit of a, I'm like an idea that I like to not even trauma such a interesting word. I like to just use hurtful experiences, like Mm. anything that's hurt us. And that has still an impact today. And just to make sure to we assess like are they able to recount an experience without distress because they are truly um, at a resolution or Mm. are they able to recount the experience because we're, they're actually truly have like um, like they're able to adapt it adequately currently have an adaptation around it. Or is it because there's some sort of blockage of feeling their feelings or dissociation or unable to feel that in their body? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Mm Because if that's where I lean into like the adaptive information processing theory around EMDR, that ideally if we're moving forward, it's because we've made an adaptation that's helpful or healthy or useful that allows us to move past those incidences. Yeah. And I also think too, incorporating that window of tolerance idea in that time Mm -hmm. too, right? Like people being able to move forward at certain times because Mm -hmm. of their window of tolerance. So I think that's, that's also relevant as well. Yeah. And like, for example, um, we could logically as like mature adults judge an experience to be not traumatic in a moment like I'll be really silly like we get um we have a bad paper cut I don't know whatever it may be (laughs) and so we can judge that that is not traumatic because we can judge it as like who we are as adults to look at it in that way with our biases and whatnot but if we go to the window of tolerance and there if there's too many we could judge as small stressors or incidents happening that metaphorical paper cut 
could then end up being the traumatic incident because we're no longer able to tolerate and manage any more distress. Mm -hmm. And I think that really speaks to the concept of pain and how people process it, right? Mm -hmm. So whether it's mental pain or physical pain, there's such a different variation in pain. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, I I do a lot of work with people with chronic pain. um, And and I have to say that's something that comes up a lot, right, is is why are they unable to kind of uh, move past their pain? And I I remember working with someone years ago, and it was so interesting to me. Um, She had actually had quite a traumatic childhood where she had kidney issues and she was always in the hospital. Um, and she had this very, very minor car accident that, that for all intents and purposes, really there was no damage to the car, uh, but she was still unable to work almost two years after having this car accident. And I was seeing her for uh, processing that. Mm-hmm. Um, but really when we delved into it, It was based on this sort of underlying feeling of she has no value. She has no worth because of this previous kidney issue. And I mean, I find that so interesting, right? Because it really does show up for people later in life where, where something that you think is long gone comes up as a way of she's unable to heal from this relatively minor, minor car accident that didn't cause any physical issues, but mentally she was very affected by it. So Mm -hmm. it's super interesting. Yeah. So it's more the perception or the experience that the client's having rather than the judgment of the experience. So as clinicians, we have to identify like, what are the things that create the the distress currently and and allow the client to uh, reconceptualize those experiences in whatever modality may best fit for that client. Yeah. And that's what I think the key, the key point there is, is trying to find the best modality that fits for that client. That's Mm -hmm. why I always like to kind of keep people's minds open when they come to a session of, I need this type of therapy. It's, you know, let's look at what's gone on, what you feel, what your personality is, what you think, you know, you, you can bring to this, what I can bring to this. And then we kind of choose based on that on the treatment plan. So that's what I think is really important. It's just tailoring it to each individual person. Mm -hmm. Or maybe taking that therapy that they're asking for and not necessarily applying it to everything that they experience, but just the certain portions that best fit. Mm -hmm. I remember I was reading recently an EMDR work, uh, like a book on how there was this woman, like you said, she was cheated on and whatnot. And then the EMDR workbook says like, this is not necessarily the best ideal case just from this very plain example to apply EMDR, Mm -hmm. but they're saying you can use portions of EMDR to best support that client, but because we could resource to insert install more confidence or less um, negative self-beliefs around her worthiness in relation to her partner being unfaithful. Yeah. And that's very, that's a very good point. I often use the cognitive part of EMDR where we kind of identify negative core beliefs and sort of Mm -hmm. shift to that positive core belief or more adapted core belief that Mm -hmm. I find very, very helpful. Even if you're not doing eye movement, you're just, even just looking at core beliefs can be really, really helpful in a lot of different uh, examples, actually. A lot Mm -hmm. of different scenarios. And when you were saying with like, you see a lot of clients with chronic pain, do you ever use like a pain protocol with an EMDR? Um, not necessarily. I don't actually use too much EMDR with pain. I do my background actually, even personally, just, um, I have a a chronic, uh, autoimmune disease that causes pain. Um, and so that actually I found has been quite helpful in terms of, um, interestingly, before I was a counselor, seeing a psychologist myself for how to move past or move through pain without ignoring it. Like you almost tolerate it, but learn to see it in a different way. I found that work to be very helpful in going forward with clients, um, which is interesting because it didn't actually come from my training necessarily. Um, so in terms of pain, I mean, it's obviously variable, right? Like it's either, it's either, um, physical pain or mental pain or a combination of both. Um, but certainly I think I am quite, I would say solution focused in terms of pain of trying different things that they've not tried before, but I find a lot of pain, um, or let's say a lot of the distress that comes with pain in clients that I see, especially those in healthcare are not, it's about not being validated as well. Like they, they have people dismissing their pain. Certainly when we talk about nurses as well, um, it's sort of like, well, it's part of the job. 
you know, and well, no, it's not really, you know, like it's, yes, people get injured, but it, it shouldn't be something that is, has become commonplace to just deal with. I think, I think it really does to be, need to be acknowledged. This is painful and it is difficult to work under those conditions and, and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So more, like you said, like the, um, having a, like a nurse, for example, be more accepting that this is unusual to experience all of this and it's okay to feel their feelings. Yeah. It's okay to feel their feelings. I think that's part of the culture as we go back to the culture is to kind of ignore your feelings because you're focusing on the feelings of other people. But, you know, mm-hmm. I always like to point out, like you have to fill your own gas tank too. So, mm-hmm. yeah. and so do you ever have any experience with clients with like fibromyalgia or something like that? I do actually, I did as an RT and I also do, uh, as a clinician as well in, in mental health care, uh, fibromyalgia, interestingly, and I had a really close friend with fibromyalgia on a personal level. Um, and me with, I have rheumatoid arthritis. And so we used to actually talk a lot about our pain and, and hers very frustratingly, unlike mine was not showing up, right. It doesn't show up medically. A lot of times there isn't a blood marker that's off or there isn't, um, something tangible that someone can point to, whereas rheumatoid arthritis is, you know, let's say maybe even more validating for some people because yeah, I can see on my x-rays, my hands look like this, or I can see in my blood, this and this is elevated. Um, but for her, it was very, very distressing because it, it, and it is for a lot of people with fibromyalgia where they feel like they're not being heard or they're not being believed. Um, and I think that's something as well that shows up and continues to show up, right? Oftentimes it's after a traumatic event, um, not always, but sometimes after a traumatic event, um, and it does really impact their ability to heal. Um, but oftentimes people will moan in pain in the middle of the night and they have a really hard time uh, just thriving. Like it's, it's, it becomes about surviving for them as opposed to thriving. They really lose a lot of their independence. Um, many people are not able to work. Um, so I, I do really like working with people to try and get them to a point where they can start to thrive again and mm-hmm. not just try and survive day to day. Yeah. Could you maybe just give an example of like what an experience of someone with fibromyalgia might look like just because I want to make sure people understand what it is. Yeah. So, I mean, from my experience of of working with people with fibromyalgia, mm-hmm. either as an RT or as a mental health care provider, uh, is just this sort of, and obviously someone with fibromyalgia might say something different, but is this sort of underlying gnawing pain, sometimes sharp as well, um, in various parts of their body and oftentimes all simultaneous, like in their back, in their, I've actually had people say in their legs, they feel like sharp pains in their legs. Um, sometimes it's this like ache that's really, really deep. Um, really interestingly, It doesn't seem to be variable with distraction. Uh, We always would talk about that in the hospital. You'd see people who would come in to emerge and you would distract them with something like they would, you know, say they couldn't breathe. But then when you would talk to them about something, they would be distracted and they would be breathing. Okay. So then you say, okay, maybe they're anxious. It's not necessarily because of their lungs. They're just more anxious with fibromyalgia. It doesn't seem to matter if there's something good going on for them or something bad going on for them, they still have the fibromyalgia symptoms. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's very little treatment for it. I mean, there are treatments for it, but oftentimes people um, have a hard time. They don't seem to get the right sort of cocktail and they don't seem to be able to stick to any physical um, uh, treatments because they have such variability in their day. And I know even with things like rheumatoid arthritis, it can be very frustrating. Um, just having the variability in the day to day, you kind of wake up thinking, yeah, I'm going to do this today. And then you wake up feeling terribly. Mm -hmm. Um, And I remember in speaking about that psychologist that I saw years ago about handling my own chronic pain, uh, something she said to me that was so interesting and it stuck with me. And I'll I'll tell you, because you probably use it with clients um, and people be like, oh, that's so great. Um, She actually said to me that every single morning you have to quantify your pain from one to 10. So you know, you wake up and you say, okay, my pain today is an eight. And the problem with chronic pain is that it's not just one day of eight, because if it was one day of eight, we could handle it. It's day 595 in a row of eight, right? So even days where it is three or four, we often sometimes quantify it as eight because we're so tired of the pain. So she said, what you want to do is really, really think about it in an isolated day. So I'll give you an example. If I woke up this morning and I had eight out of 10 pain and there was nothing happy going on at all, and it was like day 500 of this pain, I would be very unmotivated to wake up. I would think, oh, I can't handle this. I can't do it. Um, And you would really assign it to your disease, right? I'm so tired of my disease. I can't handle this mentally anymore. 
if we take that same level of pain, so eight out of 10, but I didn't wake up with it, I woke up really fast and I noticed that I won the lottery and I jump out of bed and I run down the stairs and at the bottom of the stairs, I trip and fall and I smash my leg into the side of the staircase. Now I have eight out of 10 pain. Mm. The first example, I probably would have stayed in bed and I would have said to myself, I can't handle this. I can't do anything. This is a really high pain day. The second example, I wouldn't have gone back to bed with my eight out of 10 pain. I would have gone to collect my lottery winnings. I would have had a family dinner. I would have gone out for a celebratory drink with my friends. Um, But you still would have had the same eight out of 10 pain. So what's the difference is our perspective. So what she said to me is do your best every day to try and shift perspective into that moment of not thinking about the 500 days before, but thinking of that isolated day. Can I handle this pain today? Um, And can I be optimistic that tomorrow it might be different in order to shift my perspective, even if it's not going to be different? So it's just a little bit of a mind trick. Um, And I found that to be quite helpful. And I often use that on uh, either patients in the hospital or now people in my practice where I just think, okay, it's not about minimizing it. It's not about dismissing it. It's just about um, trying to isolate it in that day and not combine it or, or piggyback it with the last 500 days. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I just want to pause there because that was like a really tangible, helpful thing. And I think anyone can really use that kind of idea, regardless if it's pain or other experiences, Mm -hmm. because it's a lot of the time, like CBT really talks about this. Lots of modalities talk about it. It's the way that we perceive the experience Mm -hmm. rather than the experience itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And you also highlight this idea that it depends on the other factors that are going on in our life. Like, of course, if we're excited of good things that are coming that day, we're going to be more eager and optimistic to push through maybe some of the discomfort we're having rather than if we have nothing else that's valuable happening, going on to encourage us. Mm -hmm. So it's like really about chunking your experience instead of just seeing it as a whole. It's like taking it granularly piece by piece and being able to manage that. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's a really helpful one. Thank you. I will Mm -hmm. definitely. I know I found it so helpful. And I I actually still remember that was probably 20 years ago. She told me that. And I I really think it's, it's helpful. I I use it myself and I I've heard people tell me that they find it helpful too. So. Yeah. And it makes me think of like behavioral activation, especially for like mood dysregulation that we want to check in with how we're feeling and then um, Mm -hmm. try a helpful coping skill or activity of some sort, and then check in afterwards of our feelings of accomplishment, our feelings of our mood afterwards to see if there's that, that change change. Mm-hmm. And sometimes people are like, I did that, but like, it was like one point different. I'm like, well, that one point is still something. Mm-hmm. Right. And so that allowed you to even have that challenge of trying to do it and see if you can change your mood and your experience is reinforcing the more helpful, healthy behaviors that are good for your overall well-being, regardless. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I really like that one as well. <laughs> um, so earlier you were saying like one of the barriers for first responders having support was that negative judgment of self and not feeling feelings. Are there any other barriers that you find that come up with um, first responders and healthcare workers of like getting into counseling or maybe possibly having mental health support? I would say burnout and compassion fatigue are huge right now, right? Is that they're, they're almost past the point where they just feel like, Oh, I can't, I don't have time for that. I, I, you know, uh, I, I, I don't even think it would be helpful at this point. Um, and I always encourage people, even if just to vent, it's important. Right. Um, and, and sometimes I'll do that, you know, where, and that's kind of what's helpful about me working in the past in, in frontline healthcare is, is listening to their experience and just allowing them to vent. Um, and we do have a back and forth of like, why didn't they use this? Why did they give epinephrine there? Why didn't they give attribute? Like all these different things. And they say, exactly. That's exactly what I was thinking. And sometimes it's just helpful to kind of bounce something off. Um, but I would say that's a big barrier. You know, it's a lot of these people are, uh, I mean, they're regular humans, right? They're working 12 hour shifts. They're coming home. They're still cooking dinner. They're still being with their families. They're supporting their spouses, um, their parents. They have elderly parents. Uh, some people have, have lost coworkers either because um, of the pandemic and they don't want to work there anymore or because of actual loss of life. Um, so I think those things are all barriers, right? It feels like too much. And where do I even begin? So I won't even start. 
Mm -hmm, Definitely. So it's just like having that space to connect. So I feel like you highlight this idea too, that it would maybe be possible and helpful to have social circles that share the same profession as a healthcare worker, but then also maybe to have a social circle that is a different profession as well. So you have that social circle that is validating and that you can vent and really connect but still having the other experiences that would maybe allow you to see life in a larger perspective, not just Mm -hmm. only healthcare. Yeah. I always talk about minimizing uh, COVID moments, for example, in a day for healthcare workers, because you go to work and you're immersed in it. You're wearing PPE. um, You're dealing with sick people and COVID is still going on in the hospitals. You know, like I actually, a friend of mine in Toronto's dad just was denied surgery for, for uh, almost a month because they have no beds. And so it's still the, the ripple effects of that are still happening. And so I often talk about that. I mean, I I think sometimes it's, it's important to just, um, I don't know, acknowledge that, I guess, is, is really what, you know, is important. It's just acknowledging that, that that's what they're feeling and that, that it is too much and that things are still going on for them. And, um, and for everyone else, to be honest with you, like it's not just healthcare workers, right? It's, it's everybody, even though everybody is excited equally about things opening up and, um, and that kind of stuff, things have really changed during COVID. And I think there's, there is still that ripple effect and, and people do need to be supported in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, I'm just seeing if I had any other questions. Um, earlier, we also kind of talked about this idea of like PTSD, um, would you maybe treat someone differently if they have the diagnosis of PTSD or not versus also like um, ASD, like acute stress disorder? Um, it depends on how the person's responding, right? Like I, I really like to think of just tailoring things to, it's it's about coping skills. It's about their ability to self-regulate, that kind of stuff. Some people I spend a ton of time um, just kind of creating a safe space and creating a box that sits beside them and opening the lid and putting mm-hmm. stress and fear into it and shutting the lid. Um, other people really do a really good job of self-regulating. I have had people with, for example, EMDR who um, there's so much trauma that it's almost like a floodgate that opens and it's way too much. Um, so then we just start really, really surface level. Like it's not about everyone disappointing you or everyone um uh, being a certain way to you over time. It's about this one person who didn't shovel your driveway or, you know, and we just pick a really surface level thing. Um, so no, would I treat them differently? I think I treat everybody differently. It just depends on, it just depends on what their individual coping skills are, what their experiences are. Um, and also to what their self or beliefs about self are, right? Some people don't feel like they can improve their lives. Like they don't feel like they can affect change. Mm. And I think that's a big part of counseling as well is at what point are they coming to counseling? Are they looking to vent or assign blame or are they looking to do some work themselves or do they feel like they're even capable of doing the work? Mm -hmm. Because it's like really helping clients understand that like some clients come and they go, I know this is cheesy, but like fix me or like more of that back seat. And they assume that the therapist is in the driver's seat. It's like, no, no, like you're in the driver's seat. Mm-hmm. Where are we going? I'm your passenger. And I'm, I'll have a map of like information to support you, but mm-hmm. where are we going together? And you're, you're driving. And like, what are you hoping for out of this experience? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something I have to be careful of personality wise, because I am very outgoing and very extroverted and I can talk a lot. Um, and so when people come to me, there's some, like, it's, it's fine when someone's talkative and they're sharing and that's great. I just sit back and listen, but there are clients who really don't say much. Right. So then it's sort of like, okay, what do you want to talk about today? I don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. okay, that's fine. I can talk, but then at the same time, I want to hear what's going on for them. So it is something I always, that's a personal thing that I have to always check myself on or work on is that I think, okay, don't lead the conversation and then drive it. Mm -hmm. Like ask an open-ended question and see where it goes, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Just reiterating the normalcy and the helpfulness of the therapeutic pause. It's okay to just not say anything as a clinician and allow that client to have that time to really formulate what they're wanting to work on. Mm -hmm. Or, and just as a reminder, clinicians, it's okay to not work harder than your client. It's okay to like, let your client actually think about where they want to take that time, you know, Mm. and I'm not saying client needs to show up and like, be like, I am super overly prepared for our session today. It's like, no, no. Like if a client 
it would be ideal if a client could come with like one thing or a, a kind of a theme or something that they're wanting to take the session with, or that we're working together to have that session planning and treatment planning of what we're trying to work on. But it is again, okay, just sit back and let the client work harder than you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I also think too, the connection, right? Like it's sometimes you just have people and they don't connect with you and that's okay. Right. As a clinician mm-hmm. to just remind yourself, like, it's okay. <laughs> um, it's, it doesn't mean anything bad about you. It doesn't mean anything bad about the client. It's just, it's just trying to find that therapeutic alliance with people. Right. So definitely. And just giving them that guidance. And I think it, like you said, it depends on the client. Like if it's their first session and they've never had counseling before, that's okay. Maybe for a clinician to step forward and be like, well, this is what we could make this time look like. Here are some options or giving like the buffet choice. I always do that to clients. I'm like, do you want to learn something new today? Do you want to share something? Do you, would you want something to change? Maybe I'll hit them with the miracle question. Like when you're sleeping and a miracle happened, what would be different in your life when you woke up the next day? Right. And just yeah. kind of helping them to get started. Right. Mm-hmm. But I find that if we're midway through after many sessions and a client's like, I'm not really sure what I want to talk about today, then that can kind of beg the discussion of like, is there something else that we're needing to work on? Or are you meeting your goals? And we can titrate having less sessions, like less frequently, right? So Mm -hmm. things like that. So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wonderful. Was there um, anything else you wanted to take this conversation today around first responders, healthcare, uh, anything that we've missed that you feel like it's important to share? Um, I would just say just sort of uh, holding that space for whether you're a healthcare worker or you're not a healthcare worker, just allowing everybody to kind of meet them where they are, you know, as opposed to sort of deciding where people should be at this point in the pandemic. Some people are really excited about where we're at. Other people are really struggling. Um, And I think that goes for healthcare workers as well as non-healthcare workers. So I think just reminding everyone to kind of meet everyone where they are and not, um, not let's say judge where we should be. Um, because as I said before, I've seen some healthcare workers who are just completely over it. I've actually talked to some healthcare workers who the pandemic was not really much for them because they're like, yep, I'm still going to work. I'm still wearing PPE. It's no different than having somebody with, you know, MRSA or tuberculosis or whatever. I just wear my mask all day and it's no different. Um, and then other healthcare workers who've been profoundly affected. Um, and so I think it, it's just meeting people where they are. Mm-hmm, definitely. I think that's a really great point. So I really appreciate all that you've shared today. I've learned so much. I just really see your passion for your clients, especially stemming from your personal background and bringing all that wonderful healthcare knowledge um, into your counseling practice. And um, yeah, I really appreciate you joining us today and just to share everything that you have. Thanks so much. I appreciate you having me, Haley. Yeah, thank you. Mm-hmm.